Aren't you glad that the Lord is the only one that's worthy, including everyone in this room who deals with are we worthy or not? Let me help you. No, you're not. But it's the Jesus in you that allows us to be able to do and be who we are because if it was left up to us, there is no one worthy. Happy Father's Day. I want to encourage you. That may be the most encouragement you get today out of this message. Because the Lord knows exactly what he's doing and how he's laid this out uh, for the day in which we read this text out of Ezra. Now, last Sunday, we talked about Ezra and why we need to, in this day and age, and coming out of a pandemic and coming out of the fear, why I believe it is a word for, from God for us as we go through the book of Ezra to understand that not everybody's going to come back. I've talked to four different pastor friends who've said, well, I just wonder how many people's got out of the habit and is not going to return. Well, let me help you. If your life is a habit with Jesus, you don't have a life. Okay? I have a habit of eating German chocolate cake. But I don't have a habit of walking with Jesus. He walks in me. I can't be separated from him. Do you hear what I just said? So today, as we look at verses 5 through 11, I want us to look at being stirred as not only daddies, but everybody stirred to serve. Now, I want to start by way of introduction, just kind of bring you through some things, that if we're going to return, if we're going to rebuild, and if we're going to have revival like Ezra deals with, then we need to understand that God first has to shake us up to steady us. He's first, he first has to wound us before he can heal us. He first, listen to me, has to crucify us before he can live in us. Are you listening? And so as we understand this idea of what is going on as we come out and this fear and what this pandemic's really exposing is the counterfeitness of what a lot of people are calling Christianity. We're going to look at that today. See, God really has to dismantle us so he can bring us together. See, I, I don't believe any of this caught the Lord by surprise, and you can be a conspiracy theorist, and you can be a political whatever, but I'm just telling you right now, God is stripping the church of everything the church has depended upon and he allowing the counterfeits to get exactly what they want. What do what I mean by that? This is what I mean. If people want to stay in their pajamas and watch it on TV, you got it. But that's not being a church. You say, well, Brother Brad, I don't have to go to church to be saved. No, but if you're saved, you're going to go to church. Amen? I mean, if you're going to be a daddy, you're going to go home with your kids. Amen? So let's just walk through this. Why don't you stand back up? We're going to read this text just out of reverence of the reading of the Word of God and understanding that the Spirit of God has stirred in Cyrus, who is a pagan king. Now it comes in verse 5. And it says, then the heads of the father's houses, did you hear that? The heads of the father, I don't think it's by accident we're on Father's Day and we're on verse 5. Then the heads of the father's houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, watch this, with all those, with, with all those whose spirits God had moved, it is only those folks that the spirit of God moves in, and we're going to get in on that in just a second, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock and with precious things, besides all that was willingly offered. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of his God. Now, this is not going to be part of my sermon, but it is going to be part of my sermon. Don't, I want you to understand that even pagan lost people can participate in worship. And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and counted them out to Sheshbazzar, the prince of Judah. This is the number of them. Y'all got to watch this. 
Everything in, in the Word of God is in there for a purpose. This is the number of them. 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of similar kind, and 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. All these, Sheshbazar, took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to Jerusalem. This is the word of God. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. May we be shaken well today because many things before you she must shake well. If we're not going to be shaking, if we're not going to be willing to be shook, then we will always, always remain the way we are. Until you get sick and tired of who you are, you'll stay the same. So today I want to give you two important truths with some sub points about these verses of why it's important that we understand what 5 through 11 tells us. Amen? First of all, I want you to understand the results of the fathers. I want you to look at the results of the father, fathers found in verse number 5. The results of the father gives us an understanding that there's two types of fathers. There's two types of leaders. There are two types of individuals. Those that are willing to go and return and those that are going to remain. Today, as the Spirit of God stirs you, you're going to have to make a decision. These individuals had to make a decision. For 70 years, are you listening? For 70 years, they've been in captivity in Babylon. They hear from the king, you can go back to Jerusalem. And there's two groups of people. So first of all, let's look at the, those who were stirred. Let's look at those who were stirred enough to return. Now, I'm going to walk you through a couple of things that they returned to. If you're ready, say Amen. First of all, I want you to understand that those that returned were willing to leave the fortunes of Babylon. Now, I want you to hear what I'm about to say because you turn the TV in on and you hear a health and wealth gospel that's not biblical gospel. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. These people were leaving and going to a place that was desolate. TBN tells you God wants to take you to a place that's better than where you're at. Sometimes God's stripping you. Are you listening? For 70 years, they've known the comfort and the ease of Babylon, and they've heard news. And, and when we get to chapter 7, when Ezra and Nehemiah really begin to come back and Nehemiah begins to rebuild the wall, and by the way, Esther... Esther is written in the time of chapter 7, okay? 80 years after this first bunch leaves, 80 years later, the next bunch comes because it took 80 years for the rest of them to realize that they needed to get out of Babylon. Can I get an amen in the house? These folks are not going from West Point to Lawrenceburg. Are you listening? These folks are leaving a fortified city to go where everything is ruined and burnt to the ground. How many want to do that? See, American Christianity is we want to go where everybody's going to receive the gospel. We want to go where there's no danger. How many, of them want, to, how many want to really go to the Muslim countries? How many want to go to the war-stricken countries? How many want to go teach Sunday school where nobody's going to listen? These folks, because the Spirit of God stirred in them, didn't care where they were going, didn't care what they were going to, and didn't care what they were leaving. See, some of us are too tied up into the world to follow the Lord. God can stir and God can stir and God can stir, but it's going to cost you way too much to be moved by God. They left the fortunes of Babylon. They had the ease of living. 
They didn't have to worry about where their next meal was. They lived in a communist country. They could just go and live off the government. All they had to do was just show up, and they were taken care of. They all had houses. They all had land. They all had livestock. They all had silver and gold. How do I know it? Because the Bible says they encouraged them with all that stuff. They had all of their stuff, and these people were willing because the Spirit of God stirred in them, willing to leave all of it to go to nothing. That's biblical Christianity. When the Apostle Paul says he learned to be content with much and be content with nothing, see, the truth of it is, is we pray God bless us. When's the last time you prayed God strip you? Amen? I mean, if you really want to be stirred by God and you really want to be where God will have you to be, when was the last time you really, we, I mean, we say, I surrender all. Do we really surrender all? So these folks are going to go to a place. They're going to have to build homes. They're going to have to build cities. They're going to have to build the economy. They're going to have to build everything. They're starting from nothing. They're starting from scratch. Are y'all listening to what I'm telling you? The Spirit of God stirred in them. I want you to hear me. For 30 years, I've watched people be stirred in worship. Some are stirred by a song. Some are stirred by a sermon. But only those that Return are those that are stirred by the Spirit. See, we can sing a southern gospel song, and some of y'all just shout amen, glory, hallelujah, but it don't change not one way how you live. You can have a motivational speaker to get up and let you cheer, cheer you on and have people standing on their feet and applauding their hands, and they live absolutely no different than when they walk out of this room because they've never been stirred by the Spirit of God. And we live in a culture where people want to be stirred by song and by sermon but not by the Spirit, because the Spirit may take you to a desolate land. Do you remember Philip and the, uh, the Ethiopian, don't you? You remember that, don't you? He's in a revival in Jerusalem, and God took him out to the desert. God took him to Lodabar. How many of us are willing? Amen? Look at Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. This is 80, I want you to hear me. This is 80 years after we're reading verse 5 of Ezra chapter 1. Look at what Nehemiah says. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province, in other words, the people that are still living that left in Ezra chapter 1 verse 5, they're in great distress. Are you getting it? They're in great distress and reproach. They're in shame. They're in great, listen, they don't have a Walmart. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned. They're in desolation. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 2 and 3 says this. Therefore the king said to me, after Nehemiah has prayed, and God stirred in Nehemiah to go rebuild the wall. The king, he goes before the king and here's what the king says. And the king said to me, why is your face so sad since you're not sick? There is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid because he's standing before the king. Here's what he says. And I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, in other words, where I buried mom and them, the cemeteries, lays waste and its gates are burned with fire. Do you understand that these people that returned went back to nothing? But we live in a day and age where we're going to go where there's something for me. If I don't get nothing out of it, I ain't going. The results of the fathers, the first group of fathers, the leaders, they left the fortune. Daniel chapter 1, verse 9, for those of you that's been in Sunday school, what did Daniel do? Daniel purposed in his heart not to be defiled by the king's food. You know what that means? The king's food wasn't cabbage. And for those of you that don't know, there will be no cabbage in heaven. I don't like cabbage. The king's food was the delicacies. Daniel said, you know what? I don't want the delicacies. I don't want the greatness and the fatness of the world. I want to take what God's given me. How many times do we miss God's best because we settle for better? Many times as we act as though that the world has more to offer. And what the world has to offer is much better than the Lord. Because we're worried about numbers. Are you listening to me? 
Remember the Kyle talked about this the other day. If Jesus had been a Southern Baptist, he never would have fared well in the church growth movement because he fed 15,000 folks fish and bread, and when he ascended and left the pulpit, there was only 120. They were in big decline. Amen? I want to ask you a question. What better place is there to serve in the Lord than where the Lord stirred you and led you? But we always look for the amenities. I'm talking about pastors too. Man, when a church begins to look for a pastor, they'll tell them all that what they have to offer. Amen. I got a lot to say about that. I got to move on. Not only did they leave the fortunes of Babylon, but they left the familiarity of Babylon. See, most of us don't go somewhere new because we're scared of the unknown. 50,000 people leave Babylon not knowing what they're going to see, but they've heard that it lays in ruins. And they didn't go just so they go see and sightsee and take photographs, which is what most mission trips are. Most, most Baptists believe that Matthew 28 says go into all the world and take photographs. Go sightseeing, share the gospel every now and then. No, you, you ought to be about the kingdom. They left the familiarity of Babylon. Don't you think in 70 years they've been established? I mean, you just think about where you guys are living now. You don't realize how much junk you've collected over the years, do you? I mean, they, they left the familiarity of Babylon. It's been 70 years. It's their way of life. They've been settled in. Listen to me. But the people that settled in is the one that God needs to stir the most. Not only did they have their own idea of being settled in, but I guarantee you, these folks right here had to crucify that idea and that thought of what's in it for me. They had to crucify the thought, what can I gain by going to serve? What's in it for me if I keep the nursery? What's in it for me if I keep can do? What's in it for me if I go to Sunday school? What's in it for, they had to crucify every bit of that. Yeah. What's in it for me if I sing in the choir? What's in it for me if I'm an usher or greeter? What's in it for me if I'm a deacon? What's in it for me from this, that, whatever? You, you, you fill in the blank. These people, because the God stirred in them, was able to crucify the selfishness and the desires of their own heart. They were settled in. Me and my family's Okay. We all right. Y'all do whatever y'all want to do. You're not going to change my mind. They left the familiarity of Babylon. They left the fortune of Babylon. But let me tell you something else. They left their families in Babylon. I want you to see in verse 5, it says, Only the tribes of Benjamin and the tribes of Judah went. And the heads of the father's houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all those with all whose spirits God had moved rose up to go up or arose to go up and build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. I want you to understand everybody didn't go. As a matter of fact, there's right at 1.7 million people at this time and only 50,000 of them went back to church. Now all of them claimed to be God's people. All of them had been praying that God would deliver them. All of them had trusted God to take care of them. But when it came time to leave and go back, they're like, I don't know if I want to go back to, to nothing. They left their families. Here's what's amazing about these things, and I, I, I could have preached a whole sermon on this, but let me just talk about these two tribes for just a second. These two tribes made up the southern kingdom. The children of Israel have been, the nation of Israel have been divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. There's ten tribes in the northern kingdom. There's two tribes in the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin. Judah was the largest tribe. Benjamin was the smallest tribe. But because the northern kingdom had already been attacked, there had been an infiltration of the Jews moving down to the southern kingdom because they surrendered to the Babylonians because the Persians and the Assyrians had forced them down there, and now the Babylonians have taken over because now Cyrus is king, not Nebuchadnezzar. Y'all remember? Daniel. 
So now Cyrus is king, and so all these people are going, going, hey, man, it, it's a whole lot better here. So Judah being the largest tribe, Judah was the man, I want you to hear me, Judah was the son that volunteered to become a surety and a guarantee when Joseph put the silver cup into the, to the sack of Benjamin, and Judah goes, no, 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 no. You can't keep my brother here. Keep me here. What's a picture of Jesus being our ransom? Amen. You find that in Genesis 44, 33, 34. You find where he goes, listen, I, I promised my daddy that I'm going to protect you. It says, now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life. Y'all ready? The father's life is bound up in Jesus' life, not ours. It will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant of our father with sorrow to the grave. Listen to what he says in verse 32. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Verse 33. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad. Substitutionary atonement. Judah said, Let me stay. Let him go. Amen. Let, let my servant become, let me become a slave to my Lord and let the lad go up with his brothers. For he shall go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. And so basically you find Benjamin being the substitutionary atonement and the surety for, ben, uh, I mean, uh, Judah for being that for Benjamin. Now let's talk about Benjamin, amen? What is Benjamin? Benjamin not only is the individual who is the youngest born. He was the smallest tribe. But Benjamin and his tribe was where two people that you're going to be studying about in the very near future called Mordecai and Esther were from. Mordecai and Esther were Benjamites. They were from the tribe of Benjamin. Where do we find that? Esther chapter 2, verse 5. And you say, why is that important? Because as you read through this historical narrative of what's going on with these captivities coming, the captives coming out of Babylon, Esther in Sushan, the sinner there, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. And Esther is his niece, and he takes care of Esther when Esther's parents die. Esther is an orphan, and her uncle takes her and raises her. And Esther comes and stands before the king, just like Nehemiah did, and said, for such a time as this. Anybody listen to what I'm saying? It all ties together when you really begin to study it. And so, as Esther chapter 2, verse 5 tells us that they're Benjamite, listen to what... Esther 2, 7 says, And Mordecai had brought up Hadasha, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as her own daughter. So these first fathers, these first leaders of their family, they left the fortune, they left their family, and they left the familiarity. 50,000 of them returned. Who came? The priests, the Levites, and the singers. Why? Because the whole purpose of them leaving captivity was to come back to worship. Ezra chapter 2, verse 64 and 65. Just turn one page into Ezra chapter 2. Y'all need to pray for me next week because I got a lot of names that's listed in the beginning of chapter 2. And if you're going to be an expositor, you got to walk through those names. So just get ready. Amen. There's 70 verses in chapter 2. Praise the Lamb of God. Can I get an amen? Verse 64. The whole assembly together was 42,360. Besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 200 men and women singers. That's a pretty good sized choir, Brother Mark. So you got those that were stirred. But the second group of folks were those that were settled, those that remained. You had those that were stirred to return, but then you had those that settled and remained. So I want to walk through just real quickly about those that stayed. 
So if the first ones were stirred and left those things, those that remain love those things. So let's walk through it. Exodus 16.3. Let's look at what Exodus 16.3 says. Okay? Because it's not just a, this time of Ezra, but it's also in 2020. When they've been praying for 430 years that God would get them out of Egyptian bondage, listen to what they said less than a week out. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Watch this. When we sat by the pots of meat and we ate bread to the full. For you brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Here's what they'd rather do. They'd rather sit by the pots of the Egyptian in bondage than to get up and walk to where God was leading them. They would rather be at ease. You read the book of Job and you find that Job's sin was... Go to Job. I'm going to tell you like a friend of mine said, everybody needs to go to the book of Job and hold it in their hand because everybody needs to know how to hold a job. Amen? Amen? Go to Job 16. This wasn't in my notes, but I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. By the way, 21 years ago, I preached this text in view of a call over in the old sanctuary. Job chapter 16, verse number 12. Here's what Job's sin was. I was at ease. But he, God, he shattered me. He shook me. He's dismantled me. He's also taken me by my neck. How many of y'all have been grabbed by, by the back of your neck by your daddy? Can I get an amen? He also has taken me by my neck, and he's shaken me to pieces. He has set me up for his target. His archers surround me. Listen, you don't hear that kind of Jesus in, the, in America. And I'm just telling you, if you're not getting a snot beat out of you by God, you need to check and see if God lives on the inside of you. Because the Bible says he, those whom he loves, he chastens. Anyway, that's another sermon for a different day 21 years ago. They were at ease. They would rather hang out by the pots of Egypt. Those that remained, I want you to hear this statement that I wrote down. You ready? Here's what I believe happened. The homesickness in this crowd had lost its intensity and urgency throughout the years. I don't know about y'all, but I'm homesick. And I'm not talking about son of Alabama. Come even now, Lord Jesus. And my fear is that in the American church, we've lost our homesickness. We've settled in. We're okay. I am sick and tired of Democrats and Republicans. I am sick and tired of corruption. I am sick and tired of sin, and I'm sick and tired of me. Come even now, Lord Jesus. I want to ask you, are you really homesick? Are you sick to the place to get back to where God would have you to be, that God would stir inside of you and lead you even if it's to nothing? They loved the fortune of Babylon. It was easy for them. They stayed around the Babylonians. They were stayed around the pots of the Egyptians, or just the Egyptian pot, if we're going to move to Colorado. Not only did they love the fortune, they loved the familiarity. If I go over there, I have no friends. I'm going to stay with my friends. Don't you listen to what Luke 23, verse 8 says. When you look at Luke 23, verse 8, I want you to see what happens. Come on, 420 people. Can I get a witness in the house? Y'all ain't got past that statement yet. Let's move on. Just push the clutch in, change gears. Let's move on. And if you don't know what 420 is, praise God. Don't ask. Luke 23, verse 8. Now, when Herod, listen, when Herod saw Jesus, when Jesus was brought before Herod, I want you to hear what Herod's response was. He was exceedingly glad for he had desired for a long time to see him 
because he had heard many things about him and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. See, Herod didn't want to see Jesus because Jesus was the Lord. Herod wanted to see Jesus because he wanted him to do some juggling act. See, there's a lot of people that's going to go into a steeple this morning and they're familiar with the story, but they don't really know the Lord. And they're wanting the Lord to take them to heaven and to forgive sins, but they don't want him as Lord. They want him as a pass to get to heaven. They want to, get, they want to use the Lord to get out of Babylon to go to somewhere better. See, Herod was familiar. Those that remain stay in the familiar. They're okay sitting in the same chair, parking in the same parking spot, doing the same thing in Sunday school. We're not going to come any other time than Sunday morning. Those that settle in, settle in. And saying, I shall not be moved. Two groups of daddies. So I'm going to ask the daddies because it's Father's Day. Which daddy are you? Are you one willing to return by repenting as the Spirit of God stirs in you? Are you going to remain? You're just going to sit, soak, and sour in Babylon. Not only do they love the fortune, not only do they love the familiarity, listen, they love their friends. They love their friends. I, I want to read this to you because at the end I'm going to give you a quote. I hope it's in there. It is. Put it up there. The first part is a reminder for me. <laughs> I want you to remember this. It had been 70 years since the captivity of the Jews. It was 70 years since they had been deported into Babylon. So therefore, that being the case, many were born and reared in Babylon over the 70 years. In other words, that's the only place they knew. It was, only the, it was the only home they had ever known. No doubt, many of these folks had become settled in Persia and were comfortable living in a prosperous, affluent society. Many owned their own homes, property, and businesses and lived rich social lives, engaging in pleasurable and recreational activities. To return, for them to leave that, to return would mean giving up every bit of this. They would be sacrificing all that they had built up and secured over the last 50 plus years. Amen? So I'll put this in bold so that my eyes could see it, and now it's on the screen. Returning to the promised land of God not only meant sacrificing all they had worked for, but also giving up all, look, giving it all up for a life of extreme hardship. Come on to the altar. Yeah. If they chose to return, they would have to start building their lives all over again for Jerusalem and the other cities of Judah had been totally destroyed by the people that held them captivity. I want to go to the last part because this is a quote from Alexander McLaren. Here's what he says. Because of these, because of all the amenities and other weighty factors, the decisions to return was extremely difficult for many of the Jewish exiles. Amen? Here, here, here it is. Because they had to weigh out the options. Alexander McLaren goes on to say this. Flick the next screen. How many of us have had great opportunities offered for service which we've let slip in in like manner? We've let it go through our hands. To have doors open which we are too lazy, too cowardly, too much afraid of self-denial denial to enter is the tragedy and crime of many a life. It is easier to live among the low levels of the plain of Babylon than to take the dangers and privations of weary track across the desert. Some of you in this room, God's stirring in you, and you know you're lost. But you are too afraid to get up and come and admit it. You'd rather live in the low lives of the Babylonian plain than to get up and go to the heights that the Lord's called you to do. When, when the elders were going up the mountain, when Moses was leading them out of Egypt, and when Moses was about to get the Ten Commandments. Go and read it. The Bible says 70 men went halfway up the mountain, but only Joshua and Moses went on. Some just want a different perspective and different point of view. There's very few that want to go on on because we just settle in. We'll pull for the Vols and the Titans and the Braves. They probably none of them going to play this year. 
What are you going to do? Can I get a witness in this house? So you have the fathers, the reaction, the reasoning of the fathers, the results of the fathers. The second thing I want you to look at and consider is the returning of the furnishings. Why is that important to us? I love it. Why, why does the Word of God give us stuff that we think is not important information? Ready? First of all, let's look at the inventory. What, what did the Spirit of God in inventory give us? I mean, he starts listing things, right? So let's look at verses 9 and 10. Look, let's just look at it. Verse 9 and 10 of Ezra chapter 1. It says, this is the number of them. 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold bases, 410 silver basins and similar kind, and 1,000 other articles. And you go, well, what does that got to do with us in 2020? Well, I'm so glad you asked. So let's look at the vessels. Amen? The vessels, he lists how many there is. Then you look at the value of them, the sum of them. He says there's 5,400 of them in total in sum. Verse 11, where do I get that? Look at verse 11. Verse 11, it says all the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. 5,400 of them. Who wants to do the dishes? Why is it important? I want you to hear me. Because those articles was important to the Jew. Because that's the number of articles you had to have to perform sacrifices in the temple. How do I know it? All the other things are basins and just stuck right in the middle of it is 29 knives. What are the basins? They're going to catch blood. What are the basins? They're going to wash hands. What are the basins? They're going to do all this stuff. But stuck dead, dead, I'm talking about dead in the middle. There were 29 knives. Well, the only thing they did with knives were two things. Circumcise and slay sheep for sacrifice. That'll bless you. Here's what's amazing. A pagan king knew what it took to sacrifice to Israel's God. And a lot of Israelites didn't understand it. So the returning of these furnishings. So we find the, in, the inventory. Let's look at the instruments. So here they are. The instruments. They were used for the worship of the sacrificial system. The 29 knives is important. I mean, why would King Cyrus go, hey, y'all take all these bowls and plates back? Now, they don't have any forks. I mean, what goods are the bowls and plates if they don't have a knife? So these instruments were used for sacrificial worship. I want you to hear me. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 gives us a commentary on this whole deal. Two verses give us a commentary on what I'm about to share with you in verses 9 and 10 of Ezra chapter 1. Daniel 1, verse 1 and 2. Here's what Daniel says. Are you ready? Say amen. Because Daniel was the beginning of the captivity. Here's what it says. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Watch what he did in verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God. Watch this. Which he carried to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Now stay with me. Because after Nebuchadnezzar come through, he had a little dude that took over after him. And down in verse, uh, I believe in chapter 5 of Belshazzar, Look at what Belshazzar did. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. See, it just increasingly, when you settle in, it increasingly gets worse. When you hide the things of God, it increasingly gets worse. Watch this. Belshazzar, king, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. Verse 2. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from it. Are you listening to what's happening with the articles of God? 
Verse 3. So they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wife and his concubines drank from them. Verse 4. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. Here's what happened. When God began to stir in the monks' people, he took the articles that the world had taken, that the world had defiled, put it back into the hands of his folks that he stirred to use it back into the worship of what it really was designed to be used for. I want to ask you a question. What has the American church turned over to the world? What have you in your own personal life turned over to the world? I'm just going to be honest with you guys. And I, y'all, I know you all going to think I'm negative and, you know, and I'm a Mr. You know, Debbie Downer or whatever. Negative Nancy. I want to ask you a question. How many of y'all have to have an app to listen to a bedtime story so you can go to sleep? That's on television. There is a commercial on television that you can download an app so that you can listen to a Bible story so it can ease your mind so you can go to sleep. Let me help you. You ready? Let me help you. Every time I read the Bible, every time, he dismantles me. He turns me upside down. Can I get a witness for those that were in this prayer meeting last Sunday night? Psalm 15 will turn you upside down. Amen. I wonder how many of us have used things in pagan worship that God has designed for his worship. Do you not know that you're not your own? You've been bought with a prize? That your body's a temple of the living God? See, the truth of it is, is what we've been doing is we've been giving God our leftovers. Let me, let me explain something to you. By the time you get to Ezra chapter 9, you're in the book of Malachi. I want you to listen to what Malachi chapter 1 says. Malachi chapter 1. Just flip to the back of the, or the end of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Here's what it says. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. Watch this. To you priests who despise my name. These, these are the priests during the captivity, coming out of the captivity. Yet you say, yet you say. God says, yet, but you priests say, in what way have we despised your name? God, what, what are you talking about? I mean, we go to church. It don't matter where you go as long as you go. Really? In, in what way have we despised your name? Listen to what he says. You offer defiled food on my altar. But say, in what way have we defiled you? In other words, you're bringing stuff, putting it on the altar that isn't in accordance of what he's demanding, desires, and deserves. And you say, watch this, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, watch this, the first one is by doing, this is by saying, this is your attitude. See, some of us walked in here this morning with an attitude that's contemptible. Did you hear what I just said? Some of us walked in this room, if not all of us walked in this room, with an attitude to decide whether or not we're singing the right kind of music. Some of y'all walked in this room to see how I was dressed. Some of you walked in this room to see how long I was going to preach. Some of you walked in this room to see if you was going to get anything out of it. Some of you walked in this room with an attitude of, God, give me something because you've settled in. And yet David says, I will not offer the Lord anything that doesn't cost me something. Some of you are already begin to look to see what time we're going to get out. I wonder when it's going to be done. There's a lot of people today got in a car, going to a church service, wanting to get out before they ever got in. And we say the God of the universe lives on the inside of us. We say we're here to worship God. We say we're here to offer thanksgiving and praise. We're here to hear the word of God. Really? Because most of us was ready to get out of here before we ever got in. So in conclusion, amen.
So in conclusion, do we return with repentance or remain in relaxation? The second week back with everybody together, not in two services, do we return in repentance or do we just remain in relaxation? See, for some of us, we're getting stretched because little ones are running around. Some of us are getting stretched because we don't know how to deal with kids. But the stirring of God will always bring an acknowledgement of our need, and I can't wait to get to Ezra 9. Because in Ezra chapter 9, verse 5, 5 through 15, you find Ezra saying this. Here it is. At the evening sacrifice, Ezra says, I arose from my fasting. And having torn my garment and my robe, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said, Oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God. For our iniquities, our iniquities have risen higher than our own heads. And our guilt has outgrown, uh, has grown up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we've been very guilty. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, to humiliation, as it is this day. So you can't have revival without stirring and returning and repenting. I long for Ezra 9. And now for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant. Can I get an amen? To escape. And to give us a peg in his holy place. I just need a peg. I just need a place. That our God, listen, not so that we can brag about our peg, not that we can brag about our place, so that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in the midst of our bondage. For we are slaves. We were slaves. Yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us. It may very well be God's caused us not to be able to get together in the Church of America the last 16 weeks, and some still hadn't got together, so that he would lead us and stir us to repentance, and I'm not foolish enough to believe that everybody's going to get on board. I only know that there's going to be a remnant, but dear God, would somebody find their peg? Repair the house of God, to rebuild its ruins, to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And now, oh, <laughs> Oh, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have, said, we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, the land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land. Don't you go back there. It used to be the promised land. Now it's the unclean land. With the uncleanness of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations which have filled it from one end to the another, with their impurity. Ladies and gentlemen, that's America. That is the church of America. Now therefore do not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons. Never seek their peace or prosperity. Do you hear me? Quit seeking their ease. Quit seeking their provisions. That you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your children. Listen, I don't know what we're leaving the next generation. Verse 13. And after all that has come upon us for our, our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us. Listen, he's punished us less than our iniquities deserve. Yes, that's right. And have given us such deliverance as this. Should we again break your commandments? Should we, listen, let me, let me, let me get, and I'm not mad. I'm just telling you what, man, this, is, this has been burning in me for about six weeks. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. We're really going to find out who really has missed the church. Well, I can't wait to get together. I can't wait to get together. I've had folks in this church blow my phone up about when we're going to get together. They've been here one time since we got back together. I really miss my Sunday school. Really miss my Sunday school. We're going to give you an opportunity to go to Sunday school, and less than a third is going to go and be in body. God, have mercy. 
We have forsaken the one who has brought us out. But our reason is is because we don't want to go to where there's nothing. We'd rather stay in the comfortability of our pajama britches watching it online. Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us so that there will be no remnant or survivor? Here's what he says. God, if we do it again, why don't you just kill us all? Oh, Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left as a remnant as it is this day. Here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. May that be the prayer of every daddy in this room. May it be the prayer of every person in this room. But the truth of it is, most of us have just settled in, and we're going to remain instead of returning by repenting. When the stirring of God comes, and you want revival, you got to leave from where you are and depend on the Lord. And I believe the Lord's taking us to a barren and desolate land because we've depended on our own self way too long. We've depended on cushion chairs and air conditioning. We've depended on the clock. We've depended on seminary degrees and youth groups. We've depended upon children's ministry. We've depended upon bus ministry. We've depended upon kitchen crew. We've depended upon the choir. We've depended upon the staff. We've depended upon the preacher. We've depended upon anything and everything. And somewhere down the line, somebody's got to walk to their peg and say, God, I stand before you guilty. And if I'm going to be revived, there must be a stirring on the inside of me that I'm willing to leave the familiarity of Babylon because I'm sick and tired of living in the low-level plane of Babylon. I'm sick and tired of being dead spiritually. Some of us, over the last 15 weeks, you're dry as toast because everything that you were building it on has been stripped away. God stirs us so we'd serve him. Now, some of us, are going to be stirred by a song, and some's going to be stirred by the sermon. But there's a remnant. There's a remnant that God's going to stir. And I wonder who in this room is going to say, God, I'm guilty. Just give me a peg. Your grace is far greater than my sin. But your punishment is has been far less than my iniquity. And God, I thank you. I don't know what God's done in your life this morning, but here's what I do know. Some of you in this room, you have been trifling with the articles of God. You say, well, Brother Brad, I don't have gold plates and silver plates and knives. No, but you've had the Word of God preached to you. You've probably got 15 Bibles in your house. You've had the Spirit of God blow on you and you go, you know what? I'd just rather hang, hang in Babylon. I think it's time for some folks to start washing the dishes. I'm talking about spiritually. I think it's, I think it's time for some folks to start standing on the six-foot line. Amen? I think it's high time, starting with daddies, to be able to pray the prayer that, Nahum, that Ezra prayed. So I want to ask you a question. Two types of folks, returning or remaining. Which one are you? And what are you going to do with the instruments and the vessels that God's entrusted you with? You're going to let Mithridath, a pagan, deal with it and keep it in the treasury? Or are you going to begin to use it for the honor and the glory of the Lord? So here's the question. Are you to the place to say, God, I can't lift my eyes to you. I cannot lift my head. But you've extended grace. I believe with all of my heart that in the next five years, we're really going to see the remnant. And it may come quicker than that. Oh, there'll be a lot of people that hangs out but there's not many that's willing to go
to barren, desolate, ruined land and make a difference. Let's pray.